Do you love mystery? Ooh, mystery. Do you delight in the unexpected? Unexpected? Then you are in the right place to hear Grab Bag, Grab KXCR's bag. new locally produced potpourri of sound, or something unusual from one of our sister community stations. Every week is a surprise. Oh, surprises. Welcome. This is your host, Melissa Jones, and I just happen to have Robin Greenfield here. He is an American environmental activist and adventurer. He is a truth seeker, a social reformer, and known for raising awareness for sustainability issues. Hello, and welcome to Florence, Oregon, Robin. Hello. Thank you for having me in Florence, Oregon, Melissa. (laughs) Well, I got to tell everybody... You are quite literally just passing through Florence today, and you are on day 57, is that right? Yes. On a walk of gratitude, which is a long walk down the Pacific coast. Yes. You've walked 485 miles of the 1,600-mile journey that started almost two weeks ago, right? Two months ago. (gasps) Months ago? Yes. Oh, from Canada? Correct. To all the way to Los Angeles. Yep. What part of Canada? Just at the border, I started at the Peace Arch. Oh. And now I did step over into Canada. And they weren't so happy about uh, that. Oh, boy, really? Because <laughs> you don't have a passport. I Correct. know that. That was my first time <laughs> venturing into another country with no form of identification. And that was an interesting little experiment. They weren't happy, but they let me go on my way. Wow. Well, Robin, you're also a writer, a speaker, and a humanitarian. And I want to share with our listeners, you know, you're just under 40. Is that right? 38. 38. And you're originally from Ashland, Wisconsin? Yep. On Lake Superior, the largest freshwater lake in the world. Wonderful. And on your website, it says, Robin Greenfield lives simply and sustainable as a means of active resistance to oppressive exploitable systems. And his life is an experiment with truth and integrity. In 2011, you realized the American dream that you were pursuing is the world's nightmare. And you let go of your dream being a millionaire and immediately began your transformation to live in harmony with earth, humanity, and our plant and animal relatives. Now, I I don't want to read this whole thing, but actually I do. So at at the age of 25, you got a vasectomy as a commitment to embracing humanity as your family and Mm. Earth, right? Yep. And I want to tell people that you have no bank account, no credit card, life savings, no car, no cell phone, no insurance. And since 2022, you have had no form of government ID. And you have been living this experiment for over a decade. That is all Correct. Isn't that amazing? When you say it like that, <laughs> <laughs> I don't. I don't remember the life that I'm living every day. It's just my life. But right. if I if I go back to 2011, when right. I was there to pursue the what I called American dream, which I realized was the world's nightmare. Right. You know, if I go back to that time and I was to hear that biography of me now, <laughs> I would be pretty surprised to hear that that's where exactly where I've gone. I've taken it. To an extreme. I've always been an extreme person, but I was more of an extreme consumer before. And now I want to go to the extreme of being a human that loves this earth and that loves everybody on it and that loves the plant and animals that we share this earth with, not just through my words, but through my actions, through my being. And in order to do that, that takes a substantial shift in lifestyle compared to the status quo that uh, we have been, we've had just put in front of us and said, this is the way it is. Yeah, it's it's fascinating. I know, I can just bet I, we have our listeners' attention right now. I can almost hear them saying, how is that even possible? Mm. How did you start? How can you live without actual money? Mm. Well, I can tell you that the best way to really understand, at least for me, was to watch a bunch of your YouTube videos. So mm. even though you're living so simply, you you are educating all of us by putting yourself out there on YouTube, on Facebook, on Instagram. It's great. And that's how the person that found you in our town here in Florence, Dee Dee, who we love, just found you just out of the blue. Mm. And 
said, yes, come to Florence. Yes, and, and she didn't. E- she didn't even know you were doing this huge walking trek. Yeah. You know? I think that's amazing. Yes, and uh, it's interesting. I'm, gl- I'm glad to be here talking about this. This is actually the first interview that I've done since I left from the border of Canada almost two months ago. And as you sh- mentioned, my job is to share messages. I am a right. messenger, and I've, I've had TV shows on Discovery Channel. I've written multiple books, and I've shared a lot of messages through writing and through interviews and through YouTube and such. And uh, Oh, you did a TED Talk? A few, yeah, three oh, TED Talks. did you do three? And the thing that's interesting, the reason I'm bringing this all up is because it's vulnerable for me sitting here in this, you know, in this office with you or cubicle or what, what would we call this? The studio. <laughs> this, the studio. Yes, the padded cell studio. <laughs> stu- and, and it's vulnerable because there's part of me that in most days forgets that anything that I'm doing is remotely unique and that anybody has even the slightest interest in what I'm doing. And that is because part of what I'm trying to do is dissolve the ego and dissolve a lot of the, the mundane in my mind and the societal constructs and one of the ways that I do that is through these extreme endeavors going to the depths of the human mind that most of us are afraid to go to and my job is to not only go to those depths but to share as I'm going to those depths to share what I'm finding and to stimulate that desire in others. So, for example, my since 2011, one of my main objectives has been to observe my own mind, to simply observe my own mind. And then why? Because I believe that observing our own mind is how we start to understand our mind and how we start to understand what we're actually doing. Society doesn't want us to understand what we're doing because if we actually understood it, we wouldn't be able to do it anymore because we would see the... We would see the absurdity of our lives. And so my job is to simply analyze my mind, analyze my actions, and then share those truths that I find with other people. And uh, at the same time, I will add, I'm a showman in a sense. Like, I've always been an entertainer. You know, there's this fine balance of, okay, my job is to take it to the extreme. Why? Because it's exactly what I want to be doing. This is the exact life that I want to be living. Also, because I believe that I'm able to be of service to humanity at the same time, but also because I'm an entertainer and a showman and this has just been something that I've always done and it's this it's this interesting place to navigate. Yeah, it's fascinating. I, I wish I could put my head into your head for a minute. <laughs> <laughs> I wish sometimes that I could do that to other people's well, minds as well. Because my, my mind has been a terrible thing to waste. Mm. <laughs> no, just kidding. But I mean, I just think of myself and other people who have their heads in their phones all day, yeah. 24-7. Yep. And it's embarrassing that we are where we are. Mm. But I can't stop. I'm obsessed. And so is everybody else mm. I know. They don't want to admit it, but no, they do. They admit it. They yeah. know. You know. And you don't know what that's like even. Well, no, I do because I've experienced all of that and to the to a stronger extreme than maybe some others have. Like, like I shared, I wanted to be a million I wanted to have the fanciest car. I wanted the big house. Uh, You know, I didn't want to just be well off. I wanted to be really well off to a degree. And, you know, social media, when I first started social media in 2011, before there was a such thing as a Facebook page, I was just using a profile. You know, over time, I built my Facebook profile up to having a million followers. And now I have a blue check mark. And what is that? It's kind of like being a millionaire, except everybody can see it. Everybody can see my (laughs) bank account. I'm a verified human being with a million followers. So I still have to deal with the sort of addictions, although they're not addictions anymore. They're extreme habitual patterns that are created through the using of social media and all of these ways in which corporations want us to spend as much time as possible on their platform. So all that to say that I deal with the same inner dilemmas and struggles that everybody else does, but... I have designed my life to put a substantial amount of my time into working on that, what I want to be, which is a whole human being. I want to be a whole and complete human being in a society that doesn't want us to be whole and complete. Because if we're whole and complete, guess what we don't need? any of their consumer <laughs> goods. We no longer need a new pair of shoes every month we and the Old Spice or deodorant. Doctors, you know, we Oh yeah. You know, that's a whole other yep. thing, I'm sure. Wow. Well, 
for our listeners, you know, you've been sharing your life uh, of living simply like this to an extreme for years. And I just want to kind of summarize. So, like, you share your secret for living on only 11 things in your backpack, mm, right? 44 was the minimum. Is 44 possessions is the that's, least I've ever gotten my life down to. Yeah, that's the only items you possess. Possess. You share your adventures of well, how you forage for food and, like, mm. the only feed. Here's the only food you need to, su- to grow to survive. Or how to compost your own toilet or how to live in a... <laughs> Tiny home, and you've had several, right? Yes. I noticed that one of them was in was north of Asheville, North Carolina, yep. right? And I sort of lived in that area okay. for quite a while, so I know those people in that area. Uh, but I, also, you did one in San Diego. Yes. Where else? San Diego was the first one. That was uh, 2016. I had simplified my life down to everything I owned fitting in this 50-square-foot tiny house. Wow. So that was sort of just three year, five years into, no, about four years into my journey of simplifying and downsizing. Right. That's when after that I got my life down to, I got rid of the tiny house and I got my life down to 111 possessions, all of which fit into my backpack. Right. Traveled for a couple of years and then I ended up settling in Orlando, Florida, where I built a tiny house out of secondhand materials and that was 10 by 10, so twice as big. And wow. that's where I carried out my year of growing and foraging 100% of my food. So that was my experiment. Right, Um, but you had 500 things because half of it was cans and bottles. Yep. So you could can your own food and dehydrate. Yeah, my life has been, uh, you know, that's the thing is that if people pay attention to my work, they'll see there are no exact hard and fast rules. This is about, this isn't about polarized thinking and black and white thinking. This is about opening ourselves up and understanding that everything is intricate and everything that we can possibly look at, like the concept of veganism, you could say, well, it's bad to eat animals, right? Well, what about in the scenarios where actually working with animals in that way is actually beneficial to the ecosystem and the other species? So my whole thing is critical thinking and analyzation and observing, not trying to create these these labels that are safe zones that help us, they do help us. They're kind of like coping mechanisms, these labels, but I don't have these labels. I try not to apply to them. And instead I try to, to really look at things in a, just from a critical mind. But I'm also talking about a mind of, of love and gratitude. When I say critical, I'm not saying judging. Right. I'm saying openness and, and love and gratitude along with the deep analyzation. Whew. Well, you know, I just I just find it all so fascinating. And people love, I mean, I love the idea of living off the land, you mm. know, being off the grid. It's, it's romantic. It's, when I was a kid, I read a book, and maybe you did too. It was called The Other Side of the Mountain. Hmm. Do you remember that book? No. Uh, well, no, it captivated me. It was about a young boy with a huge family in New York City, and he just had to get out. He just couldn't mm. take it. And he ran away. He was like 12. And he went up to upstate New York area where it's wilderness. Mm -hmm. And he found a big old tree and he burned it out and hollowed it out and lived Mm -hmm. in it. And then he found a falcon and he trained that falcon to catch his food. I mean, it was so much fun. And I imagined myself doing it. You know, and the best part, oh yeah, he made pancakes from algae. Mm. I mean, did you ever do that? Jimmy. Not from algae, no. <laughs> That's a new one. And, and he whittled his own fishing hook, you know, from green sticks. Did you ever do that? Did you ever whittle your own fishing hook? I've played around with it, but usually I just had an actual fishing hook when I needed to catch <laughs> a fish. Yep. Right. It's not like your your religion or anything tells you you can't have technology, of course. Yeah. No, you can. My... Because you use a lighter to start your fires. You also have a flint just in case. Yep. Right? Generally, and I rarely use the flint. It's almost always the lighter that I <laughs> I'm find sure. on the side of the road. <laughs> I'm sure. And eventually, though, I loved that fantasy as a child. And eventually I did go camping when I lived in Utah by myself. And I whittled my own hook. But I did use a piece of a hot dog <laughs> to, to, nice. for bait, nice. which is cheating. You know, it just is. Hey, it all depends on what you're trying to do. <laughs> 
I just know that a lot of people have that fantasy of living off the grid, yeah. never having to deal with government. You know, yep. nobody's going to mess with me. That fantasy, everybody yeah. has it, and it's just so exciting to meet somebody who's really done it. Yeah, in in many ways, I am living that fantasy, and my goal is to remain in this society in a way where people can see, okay, yeah, he's living in a way a fantasy, something that's unattainable to me. Maybe you have a family, uh, multiple kids. Maybe you don't have the physical ability. Uh, maybe you know, you're know you older. Maybe you have a lot of debt. And so I like to bring people into this fantasy world that I'm living, but always remind them that we are responsible for ourselves and my goal is not for anybody to be me my goal is for everybody to be themselves to look at what I do and say how does this apply to me what do I want out of my life how can I move in the path of living a life that's in harmony with the world around me and so that could be starting to compost it could be riding a bicycle or walking it could be starting to you know shop second hand it could be starting to grow some food starting to forage some food you know it could be starting to sew and patch your own clothes there's hundreds of things that we do, and that's sure. what I consistently am doing is sharing. What can we do where we are? So my, my thing is you got to start with who, you. You can only be you. Yes. Where you are. You can only be where you are in this moment and start there and one step at a time, which is exactly what I did. One step at a time, I took my life back. I unraveled the web of consumerism and weaved a new web of a life that I really f wanted to be living. It's, it can be overwhelming. You're right. Baby steps. What do you need? To, where do you want to start? Mm -hmm. And f so I want to give people uh, an idea of how to find you. Mm. So let's hear it. You have a website, and I know it's easy to find. It's just all one word, robingreenfield.org. Yep. Right? So to find you on Facebook or Instagram, just type in your name. Yep. Just type my name in. Robin Greenfield. Correct. Because I noticed that it used to be Rob. Yes. And short and it was shortened, and now you've gone through to the official Robin. Yeah, my birth name is Robin. My mom mm. named me after a robin bird that was uh, in a nest outside of her window on oh. Lake Superior. And while that robin was nurturing her own robin, so was my mom. Oh. And I love the name. And I stopped using the name because... Uh, well, because of the dominator society, you know, Robin was considered more feminine, feminine. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Robin was considered more feminine. And I grew up in a culture where it was gay to be feminine and right. gay was wrong. Gay was bad where I grew up. Right. And and Robin was, you know, the sidekick to Batman. Yeah. And so. I stopped going by Robin in sixth grade because I wanted to fit in. I wanted to be normal. And then just a few years ago, I returned to Robin because I'm starting to fully love myself just the way that I am. And, and I want to be Robin. I love the name Robin. And so I, I returned too. to Robin. But let's go over um, your background again. You, know, you grew up in Wisconsin, mm -hmm. right? And that was where you went to college, and you became a serious partier. Oh, yes. <laughs> you, yes. I, there was a video of you somewhere where you, you made a beer bong out of a hollowed-out goose, or was that a duck. chicken? Duck. Oh, it was a it's duck. Called, it's called a duck bong. <laughs> duck bong. Hilarious. No, it's a lawn duck, plastic lawn <laughs> duck, not an actual duck. And you can fit about four beers in that. <laughs> How you've changed. Indeed. Uh, but so that's a perfect example of my character. I was always taking things to the extreme. <laughs> yeah. It's just a question of what I'm going to take to the extreme. Then it was dulling the mind, and now it's entering the mind in a more deep way. Sharpening, yes. Yep, sharpening. Yeah. So at that time, I mean, obviously you're in college, having a fun time. When did you actually know that you wanted to live so eco-consciously? Mm. I mean, what did something in you snap at some point in your life? No. Uh, you know, a lot of people to see such an extreme change would ex expect some sort of, um, you know, big wake-up call, maybe a near-death experience. Yeah. But for me, all that it was is I started to watch documentaries and I started to read some books and just realized that the way that I was living was an incredible hypocrisy, that my actions were not in alignment with my, alignment with my beliefs. Because I never believed in destroying the earth. 
I just was doing it. I was just right. living a life that had been sold to me by corporations, by governments, and I was just doing that. It's, and so once I learned just through watching b- documentaries, reading books, and talking to people, it flipped. It was just, I'm not doing this for, I was 25 at the time, and I thought, hey, if I live to be 75, that's 50 more years on this earth. I'm not going to live this delusion for 50 more years. I'm going to turn my life around. And I just loved it when you, I mean, physically show how we are hurting the earth with the trash by building a trash suit (laughs) that made you a giant monster and you walked around like that in the streets of New York. Unbelievable. I am so inspired by that. Nice. Yeah. So for people that don't know, for one month, I lived like the average person in the United States. I ate, I shopped, I consumed like the average person. But the catch was I had to wear every single piece of trash that I created, every coffee (laughs) cup, every wrapper. And I had a specially designed suit with clear plastic pockets where I could add all of the trash day by day by day, piece by piece by piece. And by the end of the month, I was wearing 87 pounds (laughs) of garbage. And I was a walking billboard for the truth behind our consumerism. For most of us, trash is out of sight, out of mind. We simply throw it in the garbage can and we never have to think about it again. By me simply walking, simply being, not telling anybody what's right or wrong, just simply being, I was a reflection for the truth behind our consumerism and the, and and what and just a, a deeper insight into how much our garbage adds up. Yes, a the ultimate in an infographic. Okay, because mm. I'm a graphic artist, and that is the way you tell a story. Yeah, and that tells the story right there. Yeah. You are listening to Grab Bag on KXCR Florence. If you have an idea for a show and want to try out broadcasting, Grab Bag is for you. No long-term commitments, no set number of shows to produce, just a chance for you to shine. I like that. If you are just joining us, we are here with Robin Greenfield, and he is on Day 57 on a walk of gratitude, which is a long walk down the Pacific Coast. And he's walked 485 miles of the 1,600-mile journey that was started two months ago. And you're doing this to help educate people about your life, and you give talks to gatherings like what's going to happen tonight in Mm. Florence. By the time this is aired, it'll be too late to join that gathering. But you draw like-minded people to your cause, just like what happened to our dear friend Didi, who is one of the most enlightened people that I have met here in Florence. And I just can't say enough about about mm. her dear soul. It's been very I, sweet to stay with her. Yeah, I'm so glad you found her. Nice. And her and her family are hosting you to have this gathering of people. And you're going to teach us about living sustainably in your quest to teach us how to do it. And, you, and like you say, little by little, day yeah. by day, small changes lead to big ones. And one, just one little note to that is that I'm actually doing this walk for myself. I, I, I decided that I wanted to go for a really long, long walk to just have time to develop a higher state of integrity and pursue more inner truth and peace. And I know walking is a, is a medium that can help with that. This is my first really long walk. So I, this was just an idea and I had heard it from others that walking can be a medium for inner transformation. So I came on this walk first and foremost for myself. That's why I'm 60 days in. And this is the first interview that I'm doing because I really am here to become more peaceful inside and and deepen my truth and integrity. And yes, why? It is because I believe that if I do that, more of that will be instigated around me. There's no doubt about that. But this is my first adventure in 10 years that really is for me, just going for a very long walk. Well, you know, I've been noticing you on your YouTube videos showing that you actually walking along and you're being passed by speeding cars and and you've been teasing us lately that when you finally do arrive at your destination, you're going to get rid of everything Hmm. you own. Why would you do that? It's only like 11 things or how many things is it now? Well, right now... It's probably, it all fits into a backpack, except my backpack's on a buggy to yes. take the weight off. So uh, how many possessions do I have? I haven't counted, but 
It all fits into a backpack and probably weighs no more than 40 pounds for all of my possessions. And it's it's maybe, yeah, I can't, I don't know the number, but it's it's a minimal amount. But I'm so glad you brought this up about my, you know, what's coming because right. I did want to talk about this. And the yes. reason that I wanted to talk about this is because I thought, well, this would be sort of an interesting way. This would be, I just thought for people listening to this, here's this guy who's in Florence right now, and he's walking to L.A., and by the time he gets to L.A., I'll go back to me. That started to sound weird with me talking in third person there. (laughs) (laughs) I wasn't going to keep going with that. But me. So I'm here, and by the time I get to L.A., I'm going to have, I'm getting rid of every single thing that I own when I arrive in L.A., every possession, down to my clothes, my computer. I already have no form of ID. My backpack, okay. literally why? everything. Why? So why? <laughs> now, to give you the why, I have to share the other piece of this. Okay. While I'm walking down the coast, I am going to basically let go of my mind as well. Every single thing that I have been guarding, I'm going to release. Everything I haven't wanted people to know, I'm going to release. So by the time I get in Los Angeles, I will have not a single secret to the world. And so I'm on a path of of liberation. And that's liberation of the mind and liberation of the, the world around me, largely through a pursuit of liberation of the mind because that's what I can control, my own mind. So the thought is this. If I release everything inside of me and I have nothing to guard, nothing to protect, nothing to hide, no secrets whatsoever, and basically make my mind a public tool or instrument and say, my mind is now creative commons. I don't even own my own mind. And then at the same time, I own no physical possessions whatsoever. And I'm talking about not a single physical possession. What happens to the mind? I've never met anybody who's done it. So this is an experiment. And now the closest that I've met to, well, no, the closest I've heard to people doing there are some of the people that I've learned from, like the Buddha. You know, this is in the realm of some of these teachers that I've learned from. So I'm thinking to myself, I love these people. I have a lot of respect for them. How can I do these teachings in a deep dive today for my own personal desire and interest, but at the same time, bring others along in this experiment so that it can serve them in what they want of li- of life which is for those that are seeking a path of you know some would call it spirituality uh mindfulness presence uh interconnectedness community interbeing you know peace integrity truth love i believe that by owning absolutely nothing and not even owning my own mind all of those concepts that I just mentioned can flourish inside of me. Now, that's just an idea. I don't know, but it's a belief that I have, and it's a sound belief if you listen to some of the great teachers. And so I'm deciding to go there and see what happens. That makes sense to me now, because I also noticed on another YouTube video, people commenting, had you lost your mind? Yes. And you took it seriously, you know? And it worried me for a minute, because you thought you were... I thought maybe you thought you had lost your mind, but I the, have. In this of case, course. you're losing it <laughs> because you're being losing it. Enlightened. I yeah. mean, literally enlightened. Well, Working on it. We all we all have some level of enlightenment inside of us, I believe. Right, but you'll be lightened by oh, the load. Oh yes, you know, exactly. Then you know. that's the <laughs> other. It's a, it's a perfect example when you release as much of the mundane as possible. You know, I think everybody can relate to this, is that you you feel lighter when you let go of the things that are no longer serving you. When you when you remove the elements of your life that are just taking your time and energy, right? you lighten and you have time yes. for what you love, you know, whether that's family and friends or fishing or, you know, being outside. And that's what I'm trying to do is I'm removing all the extraneous to see where the mind can go when it's in this more free and open state. And my belief is that it goes to a place of service. When you enter into a state of universal love where you love everything, literally everything, then I believe that the natural flow is that you just want to be of service. And that's my ultimate goal is to be a a human of service, like many, many people have dedicated their lives to. And I'm just on that 
that path as well. And we don't have to go to these extreme measures. I'm not saying that anybody else has to do this. Right. This is my path and my journey, and it comes from an, a desire to explore. It comes from a desire to find my way to be of service in this society. And it also comes from what I mentioned earlier, my own ego because I have always wanted people to see me, to see what I'm doing. Yes. And I still am. I'm still operating from a yes. place of ego. Uh, but my belief is that ego is dissolving. As I dedicate myself more to service and more to this depth in the mind, that yes, there's still an ego element, but, my, but I am working on dissolving that one bit at a time. And beyond the Buddhist uh, Buddhism and the, that kind of spiritual stuff I'm thinking about are indigenous forebearers, mm. you know, and they, you're the only one that can say you know what that is like to be an, you know, American, a Native American from way back then, uh, especially with your wisdom of plants as food and medicine, for example, you know. Well, it's, yeah, so, so it's an interesting thing. I learn a lot of what I learned from indigenous knowledge. I grew up on Lake Superior, which is the land of the Anishinaabe people, and I grew up between the Bad River Reservation and the Red Cliff Reservation. And I have been, for most of my life, disconnected from my native brothers and sisters and family because the dominator society wants us disconnected yes. and separate. Uh -huh. And the dominator society has wanted to take away power from the native people since the dominators came from Europe yeah. some couple hundred years ago. Mm -hmm. So I grew up pretty disconnected. Um, but over the last handful of years, I have had the, I guess, some of the luck and the fortune to have native people who have shared knowledge with me and, um, and when I say knowledge, I'm just talking about basic stuff, just reminding me that they're there, first of all. Yeah. <laughs> and and so a lot of, as I've continued to learn and grow, one of the main people that I'm listening to are indigenous, are native people who are speaking up for Earth. Yes. And I have seen that we want the same thing. We want humanity that is is living in and harmony. And they see that in you because you're... you're done it you know to some degree now i just want to say though it's i still am i come from the dominator culture even though i'm jewish and was an outsider still like i've had a i've lived a life of a pretty substantial amount of privilege as a white man and as a u.s american so i just you know tread very lightly that in no way i'm learning from native people and mm -hmm. i'm i think what i've learned is that the way forward for us as a humanity is to listen to the native people, the indigenous people who are standing up for the basic rights of earth, the plants and animals yes. we share this earth with in humanity. So more and more, I am putting my time and energy into learning from them. But at the same time, just, you know, never, ever making it appear that that this knowledge is coming from me. None of this. I didn't come up with any of this knowledge. I've just learned from a lot of great teachers. And just one teacher I'd like to mention, you know, Robin Wall Kimmerer, who wrote Braiding Sweetgrass and Gathering Moss. She is Potawatomi and oh. lives in upstate New York. And she's influenced the life of, I would probably say, in the hundreds of thousands of people. And I'm, I'm one of them. Um, reading her books... I speak differently. I think differently. I relate to the plants differently. Uh, Winona LaDuke uh, has been active for 40 years and has been a, a huge influence on me. So I'm, I'm very grateful for them sharing their passion, their love, their knowledge. And um, I am who I am in part because of their love and their connection with the earth that they, they continue to hold strong to. Oh, good. Thank you for sharing that. That's good to know those people. Yeah. Now, I have so many questions, but I know that you've also ridden your bike across the country a few mm. times, right? Yeah. Well, with that in mind, and now, now with you walking, what have you seen personally that relates to the impact of climate change? Is mm. there anything that's just sticking out that you sh can share with us? I would say that if you look at my website, which has it's many books worth of information on there. Yes. You'll probably notice over time that I don't have the word climate change on there more than a handful of times. Yeah, I have noticed that. So the reason why is I focus on what we can do as individuals that all have a positive contribution 
or potentially detrimental contribution to our overall symbiosis as a humanity. And the reason that I don't focus on climate change is I think that a lot of people, when they hear about climate change, they feel the dauntingness of it because none of us as individuals can stop climate change. But what I do is the things that I'm focusing on, planting fruit trees, breaking free from the global industrial food system, living a more localized life, breaking free from fossil fuels, everything that I'm teaching are solutions to the crisis that we are in. But it's just not an area that I go to. It's also such a polarized term or term that's been polarized in our mainstream society yes. that I avoid speaking about it. I absolutely do believe that our climate is changing very rapidly in a very short period of time that is due in large part to the way in humanity that in which humanity is living that is out of balance. So that's just a thought on the term climate change. And to more directly answer your question of what I've really noticed, well, because I'm traveling all over and I don't live in one spot, it is a little hard to give any exact data point there. But what I'll tell you what I notice that, that is amazing to me, right. considering the destruction of humanity, I am amazed at how much the earth holds on. These pockets of beauty, like the last two days of walking down the coast to Florence, I was, I, I was in some of the most powerful, beautiful places I've ever been in my entire life. Here we are as a humanity causing so much destruction, and yet here the earth flourishes in so many places. And I'm truly amazed that the earth is able to, to go on and in no way is this me an endorsement saying, well, just throw your plastic out the window then. No, but I, I am I am I'm absolutely in awe of the Earth's uh, resilience to the pummeling that we are giving. Now, that said, I do think there is a threshold and I do think that threshold is not that far off. And I do think that if we continue our ways, that we could see the end of humanity in the relatively near future. And what I mean by relatively near future, hundreds, thousands, even tens of thousands of years is the relatively near future. Yeah. But hundreds or thousands of years, if we keep this up, I think we will destroy ourselves. And that's my simple message. Why destroy ourselves when we can enjoy this beautiful earth that we have together? Oh, I love it. Okay, I really wanted to ask you about this because I noticed that you went, and you mentioned this already, that you went from a backpack to a push cart. You, yes. you call it a buggy. Yeah. and Baby it, stroller. It, <laughs> That's what it is. <laughs> and you did say that it was to help save, your, save you from back pain, right? Was that... Le mostly leg and foot pain. Leg and foot pain. But we couldn't help but notice you are walking barefooted. <laughs> A lot Everywhere, of, a like lot today, of the right time. now. Yeah. It, this is, by the way, do you mind if I get a photo of your feet? Because, I, or can I just look? Oh, they look totally normal. I was expecting them to look like moccasins or something. Because... So, it's, yeah, so basically, I've done, what, 485 miles and probably 200 have been barefoot. So, about half wow. and half. The shoes that I'm wearing are made of wool and leather. And so I'm trying to do the whole trip in natural fibers and natural or my natural okay. souls. Uh -huh. And why? It's not actually about this trip. It's just this is the life that I'm living outside of this. Right. And now I'm going for a long walk and I'm just trying to keep up what I was doing before, right. um, which is hard. 1,700 miles. Like I heard that people who hike the Pacific Crest Trail will go through five pairs of shoes. Whoa. And I'm trying to do this whole thing with my handmade shoes, which which they look like socks, but they're they're leather and what are they made it's, out of? It's felted wool. Oh, okay. With leather soles uh, sewed on with deer sinew. Yeah, because you can't wear Doc Martens, you can't wear tennis shoes. There's plastic and rubber. I'm trying. And... Yeah, I'm really trying. So one of my current endeavors is to wear 100% homemade natural fiber and naturally dyed clothing. Right. Including my shoes. So right now I'm wearing a shirt that's, uh, you know, homemade out of cotton, dyed with indigo and uh, weld, trying to make green, but it stayed blue. And then my I shorts that. that I'm wearing are, they are homemade and they are dyed with black walnut from a black walnut tree from my mom's front yard. The thread is cotton as well. And so basically the idea is, is that at any point, Ideally, I could fall to the earth and return. 
That's my goal in life is to fall to the earth, to return to the earth, yeah. and not litter the earth in the process. Just, yeah. Now, there is something that eh, it'll probably be gone by the time I die, but I do have one unnatural thing in my body. Do you want to hear what yeah, it is? Yeah, what is it's it? a weird one, and I've never talked about this in what? public before. What? what is it? But the reason I feel comfortable saying it is because you mentioned, you tied into this in the very beginning about me having a vasectomy when I was 25 oh, years yeah, old. Sorry about that. Oh, no, it's totally public. <laughs> I got it. So when I was 25, I got a vasectomy. Why? Because I decided that I, I wasn't going to have children, and so it was a simple thing to do. Right. Um, and uh, unfortunately, even though I had done my full research, I I missed that they put little metal clips after they cut the vast deferens. They put little metal clips there so they can't reconnect. Had I known that, I would have told him no. So so there is there is a little bit of metal in me. And so when I do return to the earth, I will litter a little bit. A little bit. Although maybe that by maybe 50 years from now, that metal already would have dissolved into my body. I'm not sure. Huh. So that was a sidetrack. Well, track. I mean, if it's steel, it's going to... Well, th- I think after 50 years in the body, it would dissolve. I, I guess. I don't Break know. down. I remember you mentioning that you use steel wool to clean everything. Yes. And now that biodegrades quite quickly. Yeah, I mean, steel wool return to the earth. And right. I, I feel like mentioning here that, again, if in case anybody's forgot, I'm not trying to do perfection. I'm not saying that we can do these things perfectly that's one of the common things is people are like well what about that well what about that oh well he does that he's a liar he does that i ate ice cream i had a i had a a a two o'clock bite of ice cream multiple bites of ice cream from dd's freezer just before heading over here there was ice cream and i went for it so all that to say is that if you are in that position where you're trying to poke all the holes Go for it if that's going to bring you more joy and love and purpose in life. But if that doesn't provide you with what you really want, then I invite you to to think critically, but not for the sake of poking holes uh, in the messenger because I am a flawed human being who is doing my best. And you know what? This society is set up in a way that it's really really hard to try to live a natural lifestyle or a life in harmony with the earth. Right. I've made it my full-time job to try to live in harmony with the earth, and I'm still not e- able to do what I'd like to do. So so it's it's challenging. And I know that was another little sidetrack, but I guess now we are fully into the realm of sidetracks, or maybe you got to get us back on track here. <laughs> well, well, well I, I'd like to talk again about the push cart. Oh, yes. What was the, what was the point of the push cart well, again? I, well, it's just that See, I lived in Utah for quite a while, and the Mormons and the, and the pioneers, you know, they were fleeing from town to town to get to Utah, and they used push carts. Mm. So is that where you got the idea? No. <laughs> where the idea of a push cart came from is I have done some studying of people who walk long distances across the country, and I just saw that they they pull carts sometimes that not behind them. Oh, and and them. originally that had always been the idea to pull the cart. The buggy is a big ego dissolver because I feel like pulling a cart looks pretty cool, but pushing a baby buggy that you got for $20 uh, on uh, Facebook Marketplace is really not that cool. It's a Schwinn. <laughs> And but people are going to stay way out of your way. Some, except... So here's the issue with pushing a buggy. <laughs> some people think you're pushing a baby, but then they're like, okay, wait a sec. Why has this guy got a baby out here in the middle of nowhere? But most people, when they see an adult pushing a buggy that doesn't have a baby in it, a stroller, a, a, you know, a, a shopping cart, they think of someone who's potentially homeless. Yes. Or they think of someone who is really uh, potentially like dealing with a drug addiction. Right. And so many people just assume that I have lost my mind, but not in a way that I'm trying to lose my mind, <laughs> but in an out of control way where I'm suffering. So there's a lot of people who are out there just placing so many judgments and um the buggy is an interesting one. I never wanted to be a thirty year old eight year old man pushing a buggy, <laughs> but here I am about fifteen hundred miles of buggy pushing and if I could 
uh, I'd rather have it on my back, but it just makes so much sense yeah. to put it on the buggy and uh, take the weight off. And the main reason I did that is so that I can walk barefoot and in my natural shoes. Because with the 30 pounds on my back, uh, it's just a lot of extra pressure on the feet. Yes. And it makes it harder. And then secondly, what I found with, with the backpack, I wasn't able to live out my ideals of sustainable living nearly as well because of the weight issue. Now I can carry food, which means I can focus more on eating local food. I can uh, save food that I forage. I can carry my herbs and my teas. I can carry my jars of oil. And so I can stock up more on the foods that are what I really want to be eating. So it helps me to live in more harmony with the earth to be able to push my stuff on this buggy rather than uh, carry, it in, sure. carry it on my back. Absolutely. Wow. This has been such a pleasure talking with you today. I I can't tell you how much fun it's been for me. Is there anything I'm forgetting, anything else you'd like to mention? Well, you know, you mentioned this, this idea of it being a pleasure to talk, and so that does bring up, you know, a bit of the, the future aspect. Once I get my life down to owning absolutely nothing and uh, freeing my mind, what am I going to do? And yeah. I, I don't know yet, but what I like the idea of quite a bit is to share what's alive in me. And I learned that phrase through the practice of nonviolent communication, which is something I'm very passionate about, or, or compassionate communication. Uh, Marshall Rosenberg is the, the founder of this, uh, which brings together a whole lot of different realms of the world. But the idea that I have is that I want to share myself. I want to share what's on my mind and in my mind. And uh, with that being a focus on, on growth, on development, on, on peace, on truth, integrity. And so my plan probably in L.A. is just to go sit in a park for a while where people can just come and talk and ask questions or be there together just sitting or walking and sharing. And so in the meantime, before I get to Los Angeles, as I'm walking down the coast, I am inviting people to join me on the walk. And so people can join on the walk or they can host me as well along the way. So yes. if you know people along the coast, the website's just robingreenfield.org slash walk. There's a form on there that you can fill out if you want to get involved, if you want to host me in your city for a, an event. And, uh, and I understand there's one guy that's been following you the whole time. Brent. Not following. Walking side I'm by sorry. side. That's what I meant. <laughs> Walking side by yes. side with you. Brent's an interesting one. Um, Brent and I started, I started this walk alone in the sense that I was going on this walk. But about 10 days before he called me up, he was interested in joining. And Brent was on my list of the five people that I want would have most wanted to do this walk with. Oh, nice. So I was like, absolutely. He's one of my closest friends and uh, very similar. We're just about a month and a half apart and we are on a similar journey. And so we've been walking together since the Canada border and it's been a very enlightening time uh, to, to be with Brent. And so if you find me on the roadside, you might find Brent as well. We're not always together, but there's a good chance that we're near each other. Okay, so people can go to your site, fill out the form, and be a part of this. Or if you are going to be uh, along the route, from here on to L.A., it's all coastal. Uh, 101 yep. all the way? Yeah, the 1s or 101 slash, you know, sometimes there's alternative routes for 5, 10, 15, 20 miles where I can be off the 1 or 101, but... It's along the 101, and I would say of the, what, 1,200 miles to go, at probably 1,000 are on the 101 or the 101. Yeah, so people are welcome to join. Uh, you know, if you see me on the side of the road, definitely pull over and say hello. Now, if you are bringing desserts, brownies, uh, <laughs> you know, chocolate chip cookies, oatmeal raisin cookies, muffins. <laughs> There you go. Okay. Where but really, uh, sal local salmon. That's the oh. gem right there. Smoked salmon. Yes. Ooh, yes. I'm trying. You know, I'm trying to eat more <laughs> smoked salmon. So if you if you come across me, any salmon, <laughs> any salmon. <laughs> have you tried fishing lately? I haven't been fishing on this journey. Yeah. It's oh, just too much. Have I haven't yeah. made the time for yeah. it. Yeah. 
Well, I was just trying to imagine you in L.A. with nothing. You'll have to mm. really rely on the, without a laptop, you're going to have to rely on the kindness of people. Yeah, a lot of my life is, you could say, they're relying on the kindness of others. And that's the opposite of what the dominator society wants, right? They tell right. us that we're all supposed to be islands upon ourselves, where we earn everything, where we work hard to earn make the money to buy everything and have it ourselves and not need anyone else. Well, my belief is that that is that that is one grand delusion. Here's why. Every time we spend a dollar, we're dependent upon someone else. We're just outsourcing it to a delusion. We still need someone else, but we're able to write it off as we don't need anyone else through this intricate system. All of us, whether we're using money or not, are dependent upon others. I'm just being transparent and I want to say, hey, I need you. I am dependent yes. upon you. And the reason why is because I believe that the true solutions are community. If yes. we can come together as a community, that's how we can solve our problems. And I believe the communities that are the most functioning are communities where people actually need one another, not ones where it's like, okay, cool, we've got community. No, it's like, I need you and you need me. Yes. So I am, now I'm not much of a sacrificer because I'm living the life that I want, but one of the sacrifices, if I'm making one, is that I am trying to become dependent upon humanity, which I don't want to do. I like to be independent. I sure. like to take care of myself, and I can. But I'm trying to become dependent upon humanity so that I need humanity, so that my love and my connection will deepen, and so that I, in my existence, can show people a more communal way of being, um, not necessarily living in one spot with community, but saying the earth is my community. Humanity is my community. The plants and animals are community. So, yes, I am dependent upon the kindness of others. And others are dependent on my kindness as well. I'm not, as some would say, a mooch. Uh, I do my best to actually give more than I receive. However, I do not do it in a linear transaction. I might give a whole lot to somebody one day without the expectation of anything in return. And some days I might take a whole lot from somebody without giving as much as I'd like to return. And I'm okay with that because I know that I'm operating in a more circular way where sometimes I'm giving, sometimes I'm receiving. The person I give to is sometimes giving and receiving. We don't have to have give and take linear transactions. It's all about creating this more circular flowing of of community style giving without rules and regulations around it, but instead of flowing from the heart. And some people would hear that and say that sounds ridiculous. And what I would say is question why that sounds ridiculous. Is it because of an indoctrination of our society? And I would say, yes. The reason why is because there's plenty of societies that have existed for thousands of years that actually have existed the way I'm just describing. Yeah. Well, speaking of money, you have millions of followers. You're getting money, but not directly. What are you doing with that money? You said you're donating. So I have committed to earning less than the federal poverty threshold for right. life, yes. which is under $11,000. Right now, I have $700 to my name. Uh, I'm going to run out somewhere in Northern California, probably. And so <laughs> that we'll see what happens. So what I... I try to minimize my involvement with money, right? Um, but I do try to use money as a tool, as as a energy flow, for directing it to the places where it will be of service. Yes. So, like for example, when I had a TV show on Discovery Channel, the contract was for thirty thousand dollars, and in there it said no money is being paid to. At the time, it was Rob. 100% is donated directly to these nonprofits and Discovery Channel donated it directly to them. My books, 100% of the profits are yes. donated to nonprofits. Now, I do run a nonprofit. It's called Regeneration Equity and Justice, but I don't have access to the bank account and I try to keep myself minimally involved, but I am involved in that money. You know, a lot of the work that I do is through that nonprofit. So I do work with that as a tool for moving money in a way that is of service to earth 
and humanity and the plants and animals. And so one last thing that I'll mention along that is I just finished writing a book called Food Freedom, which was about my year of growing and foraging all my food. Uh And it's not for sale. It's actually an experiment in the gift economy. So you cannot buy this book. Can you barter for it? You can make a donation if you'd like. (laughs) And, And you can't really barter because I don't feel like bartering. I'll give you the book, and if you want to donate, donate. What about a a whole bunch of brownies? (laughs) You can give me brownies, and I'll give you a book, but it's not a barter. It's just two people giving from the heart. That's how I feel right now. I love it. But it's so it's not for sale. It's available on a donation basis. You can go to the website. And you can actually enter zero dollars and you can actually type in the code gratitude and then shipping Ooh. will be even covered by non- my nonprofit. This is inspired in part by the Peace Pilgrim. She's one of the people who has inspired me as of late that provides literature for free. And so this is an experiment right now. The nonprofit bought 5,000 books. Uh, we printed them in the highest uh, level of sustainability that we could. And they're a gift. And will people return the gift? We'll see. Now, ideally, people return the gift enough to cover the costs of the book. And then whatever we get above costs and beyond giving away books for free to libraries and schools and people uh, is donated to food sovereignty initiatives. So 100% of it's donated in particular to indigenous and black-led food sovereignty initiatives. So that's just a little window into the way in which I'm trying to still operate within the monetary system some um, and use it as a tool for change. And to the best of my ability stay outside of the monetary system as well. Uh, Well, Robin Greenfield, it has been such a pleasure speaking with you today. Thank you so much for coming in, well, walking in to the KXCR Community Radio Studio for this very special show. And I know I learned a lot. I'm sure our listeners did too. Yeah, it's my pleasure. And to all the people of Florence and area who are listening, I love you very much. I'm grateful for the, that you exist. I love you just the way you are. <laughs> Can I sing a, a really short song? Sure. This is a song that I sing. That that uh, Yes, it goes, I love myself just the way I am. 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 I love myself. Just the way I am, I love myself. Just the way I am, I love myself. Just the way I am, just the way I am, I love myself. And when I sing that, it is because I love myself. But as I love myself more, guess what? I love others more just the way they are. If we can learn to love ourselves just the way we are, we'll learn to love others just the way we are. And that's... That's what I'm really focusing on right now. And so I do want to say to all of the people out there in Florence that I really, really do love you. We can (laughs) love one another, even though we don't know each other. I really, really do love you. I'm grateful that you exist. I'm grateful that you stuck around for this long to hear us (laughs) talking now. And if my life has been any inspiration to you, I encourage you to use that inspiration in whatever way is alive in you to be deepen your uh, involvement with your community and deepen the ways in which you're living in harmony with the earth, with yourself, and with the plants and animals we share this home with. Ah, oh, so wonderful. Thanks, Robin Greenfield. And I want to thank all of our listeners today. I've been your host, Melissa Jones, from KXCR 90.7 FM, Central Oregon Coast's Community Radio. This has been Grab Bag on KXCR, the place where there's a surprise every week. Add a little intrigue to your life right here on KXCR 90.7 FM.